Hi, my name is Michele, and I will be presenting our work on anonymous tokens. This is joint work with Ben Kreter, Tancad Lepont, and Mariana Rykova. In our work, we introduce anonymous tokens, a lightweight single-use anonymous credential. They are basically authorizations that can be used only once. Throughout this talk, we will focus on credentials that are secret key, namely whatever entity issues these tokens will be also the entity that redeems them. We will also require these tokens to allow the issuer to embed a secret bit that can be read at redemption time and is hidden from the user. This, for instance, will allow for the construction of a block list that is not detectable by the user at the cost of slightly diminishing the anonymity set. So let me share a couple of stories from the real world trenches on why this primitive is relevant. On the internet, it is difficult to identify if requests come from legitimate users or bots. It is even more difficult to do so with privacy in mind, without login services or third-party cookies. Generally, website protection services like Cloudflare act as a middleman to filter requests between a user and a web server, for instance a CDN. They assess the trustworthiness of a user generally on the base of their IP address, which leads to a lot of false positives especially in the case of shared IP use, which is the case of anonymity services like Tor or H2P, or also in the case of VPNs. In Cloudflare, if an IP was suspected to be a bot instead of a legitimate user, another round of communication was added and they were presented with a challenge. This basically meant a captcha, actually oftentimes more than one. And because of this, the web experience of Tor user became basically unbearable. There were hashtags don't block Tor on Twitter and at hacker conferences you could even see stickers like this one. In a few years, however, Cloudflare implemented and deployed a solution called Privacy Pass. Privacy Pass is an anonymous token. It comes in the form of a web extension where after successfully solving a captcha, the user receives also a bunch of these tokens. These tokens can be later spent instead of solving new captchas. And because of the cryptographic properties of the tokens, the anonymity of the user is preserved, while at the same time it is not possible to spend more tokens than have been issued. More recently, other tech companies joined the party. Brave is right now using anonymous tokens in order to reward, in a privacy-preserving manner, users that, receive users that received advertisement on their browser. Facebook wants to use them in order to assess whether a user stands out as a statistical anomaly. More precisely, they would like to understand, for instance, if a user clicked too frequently on too many ads without completing any purchase, while at the same time avoiding sharing sensitive information about users with other websites. Google, and more specifically Chromium, want to get rid of third-party cookies. Third-party cookies are cookies that can be read by different origins. For instance, they can be set by Google and then be read when I'm visiting bcc.com. They can be used in order to assess if a user is fraudulent, but at the same time, they allow for tracking across different websites. Ideally, we would like to be able to prevent spammy behavior without tracking an individual across a web. So one solution for this is to issue tokens from popular websites and provide a service that allows to redeem them whenever we have an activity that is acceptable to abuse. In some cases, it is also crucial to protect against adversarial learning. What I mean is that, for instance, if the issuer detects a malicious behavior and decides not to issue a token, this different kind of response can be used in order to train algorithms that understand what kind of behavior led to a spam detection and what didn't. In these cases, we want to issue credential also to suspicious actor and then decide at redemption time what to do with them. For instance, if we shouldn't provide a service to a user in a block list. At this point, the issuer, if malicious, could also split the anonymity set in two. But there is a trade-off at play here between functionality and anonymity. And it's a still better, and it is still a better solution than tracking. In all of these cases, what you want is a functionality called private metadata. So how do we formalize such a credential system? We're basically looking for two protocols. An issuance protocol, possibly of only one round, where at the end of it, the user gets a token, given as input a nonce from the user, and in the case of a private metadata bit, the given bit by the issuer. 
and the redemption algorithm that allows to check if the token is valid and read off the bit from the token. For simplicity, we will assume that the user communicates with the issuer over an authenticated and encrypted channel, so basically over TLS all the time, and that there is no man in the middle that can steal the tokens from a user. In the paper, however, we will also provide generic ways for achieving security faced to man in the middle attacks, which in this case are called token hijacking. If we forget about token hijacking, there are three base security properties that these algorithms should satisfy. First, a linkability. After interacting with multiple users, it should be difficult for the issuer to link a particular token to its issuance session. In the case of a private metadata bit, we demand that it is not possible to link two sessions as long as they have the same bit. Formally, this is achieved by letting the adversary pick even the public parameters, but then demanding the existence of an extractor that can find out the hidden bit from a token. And if you're familiar with blind signatures, this is somewhat close to the definition of blindness, if we forget about privacy of the meta private metadata bit. One more unforgeability instead protects the issuer. It says that it is difficult for the user to spend L plus one valid tokens after interacting with the issuer L times. In the case of a private metadata bit, we allow the server to provide L issuance for each bit, but ask for L plus one forgeries on the same bit by the adversary. Finally, privacy of the metadata bit says that an issuance session with a bit set to zero should be indistinguishable from an issuance sessions with a bit set to one. In the indistinguishability game, the adversary is also able to observe multiple sessions, even for bits of their own choice, and then they must make a guess on a challenge session. In the paper, we also deal with a verification oracle, namely an oracle that will check if a token is valid or not. But for sake of simplicity, I'm not going to consider it for the rest of this talk and invite you to check the paper for a stronger security model. And why, why are we doing all this? Why are we giving these definitions? Well, because people want to standardize them. The W3C would like to provide a JavaScript API in the browser that allows to demand and to redeem tokens. The ATF is standardizing privacy pass, the protocol that I mentioned when I spoke about Cloudflare, including extensions such as the private metadata bit. And as we believe that it is important that these new cryptographic primitives undergo a formal assessment before deployment. Our contribution in this work has been to formally set down these definitions and provide a number of efficient protocols to satisfy them in the random oracle model, with standard assumptions and without pairings. More precisely, we provide new protocols that efficiently implement anonymous tokens with private metadata bit. And we illustrate also new techniques for getting rid of the zero knowledge proofs, both in previously published protocols and in the ones that we provide ourselves. Unfortunately, there are not many options already available in the space if we want anonymous tokens with private metadata. Full-fledged anonymous credentials are just too expensive. For instance, if we think in the case of advertisement, we need an anonymous token that has fast redemption. And also they are public key. We have algebraic maps that are being used in Signal right now and they cover a similar space, but unfortunately they do not support private metadata and they are also somewhat slower than privacy paths, for instance. We also have blind signatures and variations of blind signatures, for instance, conditional blind signatures that allow for private metadata. However, again, they are public key. And as we will see later, conditional blind signatures are insecure for many parallel sessions. The starting point of our work is privacy pass, so a protocol without private metadata. Privacy pass assumes that the participants share some public informations, a primary cyclic group and a group element chosen by the issuer of which only they, they know the discrete log. The issuance protocol consists in a blending phase where the user blends the nonce and sends it out to the server. The server then proceeds with a signing phase where it computes the CDH between the blended value and the given parameter. Finally, the user proceeds on blending the token. Verification at this point simply consists in checking whether the given group element is the CDH between the hash of the nonce and the pr parameter provided. Now, forgeability of this scheme is exactly one more DFLM. The challenger is giving out many challenge group elements via the random oracle, 
and the adversary has to compute one more CDH in order to provide a forgery. A linkability on the other end is more difficult because the server could have used different X to compute the CDH in each session and thus link a user with a different key. By decision of Diffie-Hellman, even more, it's impossible for the user to know if the same secret key has been used. And for this reason, in fact, we must add a zero-knowledge proof that guarantees that the computation of W was done correctly. By zero-knowledge, the proof can be simulated in the forgeability game and the proof goes exactly as before, but by soundness now, the protocol is also unlinkable because we are guaranteed the same key has been used and because T is completely unrelated to the nonce. Now, as I mentioned, this protocol does not have a private metadata. And one trivial, one trivial way to extend this support could be to have two keys and provide a proof that either one of the two has been used. During the issuance phase now, we would use one of the two keys depending on the bit that it's chosen. And we, the, our proof would be an OR proof that either one of the two keys published has been used. While very informally this protocol achieves unlinkability and unforgeability, it does not really hide the private metadata bit. In fact, consider an attacker that starts two parallel sessions with the same nonce T and at the end receives the CDH and also the zero knowledge proof that I'm going to ignore. If the bit used was the same, then unblinding will lead to the same group element, otherwise it won't. So the adversary has learned some information about the hidden bit. And this is a real mistake that could happen and has happened, and it shows that we really need a formal analysis and more eyes on this protocol in order to avoid security bugs. The problem of the previous protocol was that it was based on a deterministic protocol, on a VOPRF. So let me say, present a simple variant of the above protocol that um, will, uh, will not be susceptible to the same issue. The trick is basically to add another generator. Now, instead of having a single generator G, we have two generators of which you don't know the disc respective discrete log. The public key is now in these two bases. In the signing phase, we do not only compute the CDH with the group element given by the user, but we also add another element partially chosen by the issuer and the signature is done under this group element and the one given by the user. And blending is performed as before, except that now we also multiply by the blending factor, the element chosen by the issuer. As before, we must also add a zero knowledge proof to prove that the same key is being used across multiple sessions. This protocol, despite being more complex than the previous one, will have the property that the same trick of using two keys will lead to a secure protocol. In fact, now, if we use two different keys, the private metadata bit 0 cannot be distinguished from the bit set to 1 because we can find an S that will work for 1 if the bit is set to 0 via a sequence of hybrids. Actually, for private privacy of the metadata bit, there are small issues of malleability in case we provide a, a verification oracle. But it satisfies the notion of privacy of the metadata bit that I gave during this talk and I invite you to check the paper to see a stronger protocol that is secure also face to a verification oracle. The protocol is also unforgeable because we can embed a challenge in one of the two keys in a similar way that we did before and make a guess on, on which bit the adversary will present a forgery. And the protocol is also unlinkable for the same reason as before because T prime does not have any information about the nonce and the same key is being used across the session provided that we use the same hidden bit. Now let me show another completely different way for, that we can use in the initial protocol for getting rid of the zero knowledge proof. In, in privacy pass, we can use, in addition to a multiplicative mask in the blinding phase, we can also use an additive mask, shifting the blinded element by a group element of which we know the discrete log. The signing procedure stays unchanged. In the blending phase now, we would have to shift back this group element. But because we, the issuer multiplied the element by x, we have to remove this quantity by the element that's been published by the server. Verification proceeds exactly as before. I'm checking for the CDH between the element published and the hash of the token. 
So the code on the server side, as you can see, is basically unchanged. Actually, we are removing the zero knowledge proof. On the client, there is, on the other hand, a slightly increasing computation. The basic idea in this protocol is that now, if the public key that's been used for signing is different from the one published, we will end up with a completely random and invalid token. So now the anonymity set is split between valid tokens and invalid tokens. And users can mitigate the risk of uh, malicious issuers trying to trace down users with invalid tokens by sending random group elements from time to time. This protocol is unlinkable provided that we accept this partition of the anonymity set. And forgeability, on the other hand, is based on one more Diffie-Hellman, in the same way as before. Note now that this technique, this trick, is also compatible with the, with the technique that I showed for adding a private metadata bit. So they can be combined, leading to a protocol that has private metadata and does not, have a, does not require a zero-knowledge proof. I invite you to check the paper for more details on how this protocol works. Now, it takes more than uh, nice security protocols based on solid cryptography to make something useful. So now that we've seen uh, a bit more formally how these protocols are constructed, let me take a couple minutes to show what it means to bridge the gap between theory and practice. First of all, the security assumptions. We managed to move all the security assumptions to one more Diffie-Hellman. We know of quick analytic attacks on them, namely Brown, Gallant, and Cohen attack that allow to recover with sub-exponential complexity the secret key. However, they also depend on small divisors of p plus or minus one, and for a curve use in course use in practice, for instance, curve two five five one nine, it is difficult to understand whether these should consider a be a real danger because they use a lot of bandwidth. Token hijacking. Let's assume for a second that the client is sending out requests over HTTP, so unencrypted and not authenticated. What can we do in this case? It turns out that it's really inexpensive to prevent hijacking of tokens from a man in the middle. In fact, it's sufficient just to use a Mac. This was already shown by Goldberg and others, but in our paper we present a generic way that works on the top of all the previous protocols that I mentioned. There are also engineering issues that need, need to be taken into account, like throttling, how many tokens can be issued at once, how often do you rotate the keys, and also where do you store, more importantly, all these public parameters, because all the users should have the same visibility on them. On our side, we also provide an implementation based, based on the blazingly fast um, implementation of Kurchufa 519 by Isis and Henry, and um, we did it on the top, using Restrict on the top for a prime order group element. We published Xander Benchmark and we are now working on a port in WebASM that can be used to perform demos on the browser. We're taking also some other directions, for instance, public metadata, because in the real world, oftentimes you have multiple data centers, each one following its own key cycle. It would be interesting at this point to have public metadata that can be embedded in order to track which data center is issuing which tokens. Public verifiability. A legitimate question is also whether the previous protocols can be made publicly verifiable. For instance, if an entity can, be, can verify the token and then another one can extract the bit from it. Even just if we look about blind signatures, for instance, privacy pass can be seen as a blind, as a blind BLS signatures. The legitimate question is whether we can share the group element in G2 and then use it as a BLS signature. However, there is a proof that needs to be given. Also, in the case of a private metadata bit protocol, we can think that we can transform it into a blind Okamoto Schnorr signature. However, as we showed in a more recent paper, together with the invaluable help of Fabrice Menamuda, we show that blind Okamoto Schnorr signature shouldn't really be used in practice. Finally, batching proofs. Whenever we, we issue many tokens at once, it's natural to ask whether we can batch the proofs for having more, in order to have more efficient protocols. And we, re, we know that there are generic techniques for batching together Sigma protocols, but the problem comes when we issue tokens with a hidden bit with different bits inside. This is a problem that can be isolated and treated separately. And I'd like to close with a word of hope. I, I think 
It's about time that we start deploying anonymous credentials for handling finite resources and access control in a privacy respecting way. I'd be very curious to see if uh, people have their own use cases for them and invite you all to check the standardization documents and help out. Thank you.